right, everybody. Welcome to MarTech Fridays. Uh, we are a part, this is a part of the series called E4M Mark and MarTech League. It's a virtual forum to connect forward thinking marketers and technology companies for a panel discussion on every Friday, discussing actionable tactics to solve marketing challenges, deploying the right MarTech to stay ahead and achieve business results in the ever-changing world of digital marketing. Today, we have two panels. The first one is on the topic, communicating with today's always on consumer. Do stay tuned for the next panel too, that begins at 4 p.m. on the topic, technologies for enhanced customer engagement. Uh, please don't forget to use the hashtag E4M webinar uh, on Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, and Facebook. We are live on Facebook as well as our own microsite and other portals, other social media portals. Um, I will now introduce Ahmed Aftar uh, Nakvi. He is the CEO and co-founder of Bazoop and also the session chair for today. He is one of the pioneers of digital marketing in an industry and the CEO and co-founder of one of India's leading digital first marketing companies whose clientele includes the likes of the Adele, Taj Hotels, Bristleri, Tata Steel, Intermiles among others. So now I give it over to you Ahmed. Have a fantastic session, everybody. Great. Thank you so much, Sunakshi. Thank you, Exchange for Media, for holding this. And warm welcome to everyone present on this webinar. You know, since the onset of the COVID era, there has been such increased focus on business performance. And the joke that is going around on WhatsApp is that who is responsible for the digital transformation of your organization? Is it the CEO? Is it the CTO? Or is it COVID-19? Uh, and we all know what the answer is. And with that increased digital transformation, our marketing departments are, uh, have been privy to it as well. Right? Uh, we have all seen how digital marketing has taken this impetus to really drive ROI and connect with the digital on consumer at all times. In digital marketing, what's more important today in such times is MarTech, the blending of marketing and technology. You know, MarTech globally has been a $120 billion industry. In India, it's around 100 to 150 million dollars, right? So this is growing, uh, especially in the post-COVID era. We'll see a greater impetus on MarTech. Uh, today, I have a very experienced panel with me to discuss this in detail and specifically discuss that how we can leverage this MarTech to connect, engage, uh, and delight the always-on consumer, right? It's very important that we focus on that. We understand how this behavior has changed uh, in the past three months. Some of the brands doing and what are the experts of our industry doing uh, to really drive this change. Uh, so today I would love to welcome on the panel with me today, Kosh Das, who has been championing the marketing for Intel. Uh, she has over 20 years of cross-functional marketing experience and not just in India, but across Asia Pacific and even in Japan. And she champions both the B2C as well as the B2B aspect of marketing uh, and that gives a great, uh, very depth to the discussion that we'll do today on both ends of the spectrum. Uh, so please welcome uh, Roshni. Roshni, great to have you here. Thank you. Great to be here. Uh, along with that, we have Virginia Sharma joining us. Uh, over 20 years of experience at leadership positions at IBM, LinkedIn, and more recently, she's been championing the marketing at Geo Savan. Uh, she's been awarded by Economic Times as a woman uh, entrepreneur in 2018, the impact top 50 women marketing. Uh, and she's been pioneering a lot of industry first things uh, when it comes to marketing. So please welcome Virginia uh, to this panel. Virginia, great to have you here. And we just have Thank a you. lovely. We also have Nikhil Rastogi, uh, who's been championing the marketing for Dyson. Uh, he has experience of over 20 years in marketing as well as digital transformation. His industry awards including CMO Asia, MVs, DMA Asia, amongst a lot more. Uh, in today's discussion, there have been multiple practices that he's contributed in his career uh, that he'll be sharing with us. So welcome, Nikhil, to the panel. Thank you, Emmet. Glad to be here. And uh, last but not the least, we have Sonia Notani, who's the the member and CMO, India First Life Insurance. She's a very passionate marketer across uh, domains, and uh, she's also 
been bestowed with the honor of 40 under 40 by Fortune magazine, as well as Super 30 CMO honor by IAMAI. So, uh, we are lucky to have you on the panel today, uh, and uh, we would love to have a great discussion. Welcome to the panel. My pleasure. Thank you so much, Ahmed. Lovely. Uh, so, I think we should kick start firstly while we talk about Martech in greater detail, possibly a bit later on in our discussion. Uh, there is this entire misnomer about the always on consumer. You know, who's this always on consumer? Is he very different from the consumer of the past? And has, it, has there anything which has changed in the past three months with this always on consumer? Right? How are they different? And I would love to get Roshni into this discussion. Roshni, what are your thoughts? Who is this always on consumer? I think that, uh, yeah, since you bring up, you know, an association with the past, we've long passed the consumer you know, who was satisfied with a passive broadcast. And as you say now, the consumer is more engaged, he's more always on or she's more always on. I think the evolution especially is stark in the last three, four months, you know, in, in the way uh, that they're making choices about media platforms and in the way that they're consuming it. So more non-linear, more multi-media uh, being consumed across um, platforms. So I think that this has forced a lot of companies, a lot of brands during this time to find um, a method to synchronize messages across different mediums. So I, I would say that's one part of it. Second part of it is given the fact that many of us have been um, at home, there has been a lot of social and e-commerce upswing and has allowed uh, many of us access to products and marketing you know, on these platforms. Uh, so to me, when I think about always on consumers, you can... I think you can bucket them, but they're across a large spectrum, right? They're these largely social, but opinion uh, makers, they are information seekers, or they're just anxious bargain buyers. So you, you I think given the fact that they're all at different uh, spectrums, um, we've had to look at the personas and then marry it to data. Um, and then the third piece that I would talk about is data, right? I think COVID has... Uh, brought to us very starkly that certain areas have taken a huge upswing, at least from a category uh, that Intel watches, online learning, is that we've had about 300% upswing, say, on online uh, learning uh, search, or we've had 52% increase on, on gaming-based um, uh, PCs. And so when you look at personas that are you know, seeking your brand all the time, and you look at data, being relevant, marrying both the persona and data has become very critical during this time to be in service of this consumer. Nice. nice. That, that's useful. I would love to have uh, some of Sonia's thoughts uh, about this always on consumer. Who are, who are we talking to? So I, I think this is a very interesting and um, important question for all of us uh, today, right? Um, but I like to see my customers at, as two sets. Like I count myself as a digital immigrant. I didn't uh, grow up with uh, a mobile phone, right? I grew up in a park and uh, I see my son. He is a digital native, right? He's grown up with a mobile phone. Uh, I remember when he, many years back when he was just a you know, couple of years old, he'd actually swipe a screen and uh, even a laptop screen because that's what his expectation levels were, right? So I think there is a, a very simple uh, division between a digital native and a digital immigrant. That doesn't take uh, away the fact that the digital immigrants like us are today totally immersed in technology. But for us, it's a learned behavior, right? We don't think uh, starting at a digital step, we first think normally and then we transform it into our journey on a digital platform. But uh, I think the digital natives just think digital. They see life uh, as paid. they don't see life as regular steps to achieve anything uh, their first and foremost uh, uh, process or style would be to go and actually you know swipe or go online or figure it out right um, i think we need to be very cognizant of this difference so while today everybody's online and while uh, today in the last three months we've seen an em enormous of uh, acceptance and adoption of technology by people who were not probably there uh, you know so that actually goes beyond your uh, tier one tier two it goes beyond ages um, we see so much more interest adoption even on ott platforms i mean anything that is more digital today right oh. uh, i do believe but uh, as marketers um, we need to differentiate how we uh, present something or engage with uh, somebody who's a digital native and somebody who's a digital immigrant because their call to action, their time for uh, their attention span, their time for conversion, or their time to actually, uh, you know, disregard you, uh, the, the, the timing and the points at which this will happen will be very different. 
So you make a very interesting point as to how to demarcate between a di digital native and someone who's adopted digital over the years, and possibly how the strategies will be different. I would also love to get some of Virginia's thoughts on this, right? This always on consumer uh, from your lens. How do you see that? Yeah, so I'm gonna look at it in the context of what we're seeing happen on um, an audio OTT platform, right? Music consumption. And, uh, you know, when you think about personas or you think about, you know, the two, the, the two types of generations, actually, that Sonia mentioned, uh, the reality of what we've seen is we've probably seen uh, music has been a companion uh, medium forever, right? People are usually listening to music in the backdrop of all the other always on things that they're doing, right? So when you were driving, you were listening to music. When you're working, you're working out, you're cooking. It's kind of been there with the always on person. What's changed that we've observed in the data is that we used to see more time bands where music would be uh, more of a commuting uh, companion, right? So you'd see an increase in consumption of audio, um, OTT, but whether it be podcasts or even music in the morning and the evening time bands as people were going and coming up from work. Now we're actually seeing it be always on throughout. So the difference is, you know, 22%, 21%, 22%, morning, afternoon, evening. So, so what's happening is people's activities and routines are changing. And I think it's, from what we can tell, it's going to change uh, for a while. Uh, and before we go back to the commuting life of two hours back and forth and, uh, you know, being with traffic. So I think the, the interesting thing is going to happen is with this new always-on consumer who's busy in a different way, how can the companion medium of music accompany that? So, for example, we've seen you know, 155% increase in kids' content because parents are home and they need to keep the kids entertained. And so it's sort of always on as a companion parent, I guess, or entertainer. Uh, so music is, or audio entertainment or OTT has become sort of, you know, a babysitter in some ways. It is you find one hour of something to have your kid do while you're doing something else or, you know, 17% more in home workout music or 20% more in cooking. Uh, more people are doing their own cooking, right? So keeping yourself busy in your kitchen and like, you know, about 10% more in cleaning playlists. So I don't think these ever existed as, as, as companion activities before, but now all the always on, uh, we, have, we have a lot more superheroes in our listeners who are raising their children, cleaning their house, cooking, working out while also working. Nice. That's very interesting, Virginia. And I'll park that thought for a bit the superheroes that you're speaking about and I'll back to you in a bit as to how you really engage these superheroes. Uh, but before that, let me get in Nikhil into the conversation uh, and take some of his perspective as to, according to his lens, who's this always on digital consumer of today? Hey, in my view, uh, in today's time, especially with the new normal now kicking in, almost everybody is, a, is, a, is an always on customer. So we obviously have categories like content, including music, which is which are predominantly always on and, and very intuitively to think about it. But uh, there are very interestingly new areas uh, emerging out. For example, uh, remote video demo is a service that we recently launched. And that's nothing but explaining a machine or giving a virtual demo remotely to a customer. Because of the way the lifestyles are and the way the work-life balance is really mixed up, we have now a lot of requests coming on really late in the night before people are going to bed. You know, maybe a husband and wife are now wanting to take a video demo of how to vacuum their house. Uh, it could be somebody who's really getting up early in the morning and, and wants to know more about uh, how, to, how to keep air clean in his or her house. So, you know, like Virginia was mentioning, there is essentially no notion of a prime time now. It's really blurring. People want things on demand. Uh, Everybody's schedule is different and people would like to keep it flexible and therefore brands and services, they have to really be present for their customers on a 24 by 7 basis, uh, which is essentially what these, this new set of uh, always on customers is. And Nikhil, you make an important point about being on 24 7 as a brand as well, right? Is there any other strategy to really engage with this always on consumer? You know, how do we crack the code? Is this something differently that Dyson is doing or any other brand that you think is doing uh, which should be useful for the audience? I think the first thing uh, to understand is that always on is not advertising. It is a certain view that a brand or a company needs to take about uh, being of usefulness 
or providing utility to its customers. So if you are an e-commerce company, then you need to be always on in providing the status of the order delivery, the status of a return that you've picked up or the status of a financial refund that you've just done. If you're a financial company, you need to be always on in terms of honoring certain financial transactions, looking at customers, limits, etc. You know, on an ongoing basis, there is no end of day batch runs or end of week or a fortnightly review that you need to do. You need to do it all the time, almost real time. Uh, and you know, that puts a very different lens because when you put customers first and you try to be of utility, you start to move away only from content and messaging in real context and things like that to what's really of service and when could I, you know, my customer need it. It could be a late night ATM withdrawal or uh, it could be somebody who's up late at night wanting to see some, some, some content on demand. Uh, you know, companies, brands and services need to be there uh, all the time anticipating what customers could potentially ask for. So there is a lot of role for data, as was pointed out earlier, in terms of building predictive models and anticipating demand and needs. But the, at the same time, there is so much change that is happening in the world right now that uh, you practically need to be as close to real time as possible. Very recently, I saw this uh, wonderful company in India who was actually looking at uh, patients who, the moment they were so you know, they picked up a swipe at a at a hospital. They were increasing the limit on the credit card in a real time basis, and that's that's so useful and that's uh, you know so so good. But it's also an example of always on approach for an always on customer. That's a very useful example. Bringing that up, uh, I would love to go back to Virginia. And Virginia, you were mentioning about the superheroes, uh, the audiences of today. Savan really engaged them. And has things changed in the COVID era in terms of your strategies to engage? Yeah, I think editorial has actually been incredible in how it's kind of observed uh, the patterns and the needs. So, uh, you know, uh, for those of you who are uh, millennials uh, or Gen X, uh, we've seen over a 500% increase in 90s, 520%. So, you know, I know that there was a whole a period where party music and you know those badshahs and this and that were like what all all of us were listening to especially in delhi i'll tell you uh you know but actually at a time of crisis people went back to like mar sanu and you know udit narayan and, and lata mangeshkar like we had 90 percent increase in kumar sanu streamings you know 43 percent in udit narayan and 63 for lata mangeshkar so it feels like people you're smiling because all of you guys have actually uh, gone to your your favorite early 90s favorite because people are looking for comfort right and then when you look at simple things like we've created a playlist for 20 second songs of like to keep as a companion for hand washing because kids get bored and they don't want to do it and you how many times you're going to say happy birthday so like you just put it on so that's very topical of creating a playlist for 20 second songs right or uh, you know, understanding stay at home playlists, whether it be cleaning playlists. Another thing editorial has done an amazing job is they've come up with all, all of us think that we actually choose the songs we listen to, but over 70% of us just listen to the editorial picks and we just leave it on, right? And you let the radio or let it discover. Let's face it, like even though we think we're choosing, we're really not choosing. So the editors have come up with uh, all day streaming playlists, six hours of a hundred songs where you just leave it on and it's running all day like a six hour playlist like that's new as a as a as a as an offering um but then we've also seen that you know people are also turning to devotional music people are turning to soothing music guzzles etc so you know how do you actually make sure that we are continuing to uh to support that um we are not seeing a growth in dance and edm music is about a 21 percent decline um which makes sense, right? And that's also a message to brands about what kind of tonality they should be using at. You know, when you used to do a product launch, uh, you would have used like a high paced, big sound, high energy song for a video, right? To like have the product show up, that's the hero. But people are, are getting jarred by some of this stuff. So maybe you need to adopt a little, little bit of a more soothing tone and maybe, maybe also allow yourself to go a little nostalgic. 
right? And maybe nostalgia is not a bad thing right now. People are turning to things that are familiar and brands that they are familiar with and give them comfort. So that's how we're reacting to the to what we're seeing on the platform. Very interesting, Virginia. One thing that I really stood out for me is that how people are craving for the familiar in the unfamiliar world, right? And if content and other activities could be done around that to bring in, whether through nostalgia, whether through things that they're already comfortable with, rather than introducing new things, uh, that is what people would resonate with. Well. Yeah, just a point on that, you know, um, brands that have been investing in branding for many years, like many of the brands that are on the panel, right? They benefit because they are in the in that frame of mind of brands that I know and I, I remember versus something new at a time that I'm feeling uncertain about a lot of things. So, you know, a lot of people say, why should you do branding? You should do branding for times like this in anticipation. And this is not the first or last time this will happen. So I think we've come off the back of many years of being addicted to performance marketing, but it's the brands that really invested in their brand in the last few years that are benefiting. Very useful. I would love to also get Sonia into this. Uh, Sonia, what are some of the things that you and India First are doing to engage with this always on uh, consumer? You know, so uh, I've been listening to what Nikhil and uh, Virginia both said and both resonate uh, so much with us. Uh, so we're an insurance brand. I mean, imagine uh, at this time, like everything about life is uncertain right now, right? Now, uh, one of the things that we did as, as a brand is we actually always adopted uh, our brand uh, communication to include life is full of certainties. So we want to play on fear, we want to play on certainties like this. It's more often than not that the certain will happen, uh, right? And uh, we've actually stuck by our mantra and gone online with that. And uh, one of the things that we did is we actually launched uh, initiatives like uh, something that we called Harbete Insurance for, you know, for the, for the digital immigrants, right? People who actually have now just come online and they need to get comfortable. We always had online marketing and online sales for people who were, you know, natives and anyway interacted online and did your checking and compared. Uh, but one thing that did happen during this phase is we saw an increase, a massive increase in the percentage of people who are actually choosing to protect themselves and their loved ones. Right. Uh, so just to give you numbers, like uh, typically our term insurance in the first two months of the financial year is about two, three percent. Right. I mean, it's not the time of the year that people actually go and look for life cover. But this time it was 40 percent of our portfolio. So this tells you that and all of this was digital, whether directly online or digital channels, but it was digital. So uh, that told you where people came from right now. Uh, I think the other very important thing is uh, you're resonating with what uh, Nikhil said is you can't just be selling. Right. Uh, we, we did a lot of proactive communications around service, around volatility in markets, on how do you secure yourself from other uh, downsides. Right. It's not only about life, death and COVID. Um, we, we spoke about uh, grace periods. We spoke about claims management. Uh, we did a lot of relaxing outreach uh, to customers. And, and then we had to be always on too. Right. Um, if we had a claim, we settled it and we said in less than 24 hours and not because we were making a marketing claim out of it, but, uh, because that's what we had to do for our customers at a time like this. So, yes, it's, it's been a very interesting last three months. Uh, there has been more uh, interest from digital natives and we've actually managed to uh, put up digitized processing and uh, engagement online for uh, the digital immigrants who, and of those who actually were not so much online, even they've started engaging with us online. Wow, that's very interesting. Great. I would also love uh, some of Roshni's thoughts. You know, there are two spaces. One is online education, one is gaming, and Intel fits in very well uh, for this always-on audience to uh, engage with them. What has Intel done differently? Yeah, I was just kind of um, triangulating what uh, you know Nikhil said and uh, Nia said, and now Sonia. I, I find like there are two pieces to it, right? Um, and um, I did. I do agree with Nikhil that brands have to be now in service of the customer and it's more important now that we demonstrate our lean in uh, through acts you know not ads and so your acts are going to be about empathy and transparency and that builds back a lot of equity back to the brand simply because most people want to know what brands and companies are doing you know to lean in to combat you know this uncertain situation so i think what we've had to deal with is um, um i i'll take an example of what um, Sonia was talking about 
on digital natives and digital immigrants, but connected back to online education, right? I mean, if you look at uh, the millennials, they are digital natives. Uh, getting them back on online education or getting them to learn online is less of a challenge than if you look at parents and uh, parents and teachers who are new educators and now living rooms have become the new classrooms, right? And your dining tables have become the new desks. So I find that it has taken a lot uh, for all of them to figure out that you have to play new roles. So what we've done is through all the intense signals that were coming in, we were hearing that parents and educators need some help to navigate through this uncertainty. So while Virginia talked about comfort, we were looking at how to alleviate uncertainty during this time of so a whole new way to learn. So we launched a program um, just last week called PC Parchala. The unique uh, uh, part about PC Parchala is that it is an online university where we actually get parents, educators, students to come in and learn anything or, or pick up advice that is useful to them. So how do I set up a study space? What is the right learning environment? What kind of PC do I need? How do I even set up a Zoom call, right? Uh, how do I have my child not have so much screen time? What do I do with security? So I think we have tried our best to be in service of the uh, consumer. Um, we hope that over 90 days, um, we're able to continue to provide this content. We've done this in partnership with uh, with the Times Group as well as what's unique is we have a lot of ESPs, uh, OEMs, and retailers uh, creating a lot of special bundles uh, for uh, the audience that's going to come in. So let's see how it pans out. So this is one of the initiatives that's, I would say, in service of the consumer. And over time, you know, attribution will come back to the brand for having been there, helping them navigate through this answer. Very nice uh, initiative there, Roshni. Uh, uh, at this moment, I'll just take a step back because Sonia mentioned something about digital natives around their loyalty, uh, around their attention spans in the first question. And I would love to get back to it, right? And, uh, you know, sometimes there are a lot of myths around the digital native versus the people who have adapted to digital. And how their loyalties are different, how their attention spans are different, how the people who are called screenagers today have different behavior than others. So when it comes to loyalty, when it comes to attention span. So now do you think there's a huge difference between different audiences or these are just myths? No, there is definitely an overall reducing uh, attention span. Okay. I, I don't think it is uh, uh, only because they're millennials or they're, you know, uh, the digital natives. I think everybody has a lower attention span. How many people are sitting and actually reading thick books today? Uh, it's, it's something that's not coming very naturally, right? Uh, having said which, uh, it, it, they, they're also a smarter audience, right? Uh, and there are ways to actually engage them. So if the brand actually makes an effort and uh, gets to be part of their journey. So we did this very interesting, uh, uh, you know, uh, thing with IRCTC uh, a while back, where we actually became part of the CAPTCHA question, right? So instead of asking people to put some jumbled words, we actually get something about our company and then we said you know we asked a question and said if you answer that about my company you move ahead and we got the most engagement ever right everybody will need to do it instead of writing uh, gibberish over there you actually you know and we actually got very good feedback on this because people were highly amused we didn't ask boring questions uh, and we, our questions were like half a line right uh, so that's what you need to do with digital natives Right. You can't be, uh, uh, you know, uh, intrusive to their lives. You can't stop them. They are used to doing things quickly. And that also goes for immigrants. And uh, having said which, uh, yes, I mean, if you see the attention spans, I would say it's slightly shorter for the uh, natives. Having said which, it's shorter for everyone. And we all need to be really quick. All our videos have to be the first five seconds or the first 30 seconds at best. Uh, and we have to hit home with that. I would also love to get Virginia on this topic of uh, uh, the digital first audience having fickle loyalty and attention spans. Uh, have you experienced that when it comes to Jiu, Savan? I mean, I think, uh, you know, I'll talk about in the context of, you know, the advertising um, experiences that work and don't work, right? So I come from a very high involvement platform like a LinkedIn where actually there were people that for explainer videos would stay on for three, three and a half minutes. You know, we have an audience here who's going to listen to a webinar for 40 minutes. You know, audio spots are 15 seconds, right? But audio spots have always been 15 seconds, uh, whether they be back when it was radio. The difference with the digital medium is you, you have to always uh, 
do companion banners and integrations as they go through the app. So what we do is, for example, our native solution is 15 seconds of audio. And for the next 15 minutes, they'll actually see that same brand while they're in the app. And because we figured out that because their attention spans are small, instead of trying to do a 30 second ad or a one minute ad, you just have to increase your frequency and variety of how you're exposing your um, ad units. So they hear it, they see it at the top, they pick a song, they see it again at the top of the playlist, then they see it and it's only after, and we know that the frequency is six, right? I mean, that's the magic number, which is in 15 minutes, that's, about how long it takes for someone to be like, oh, dice it, you know? And so it's just what it is. So the challenge with these, uh, these things of us being able to shrink down ads, you know, it used to be do, you now use six second ads and whatever, is six seconds is not enough to drive brand recall. So what else can you do with that six seconds, 15 seconds that actually builds it into, you know, it's heuristics, right? You're now starting to play with mind games to say, I remember sort of, hearing and seeing so it's both senses right i'm seeing and i'm hearing about a brand someone said the word and there's a visual right and now we're going to be adding video as well and you just have to kind of give them bits and pieces right it reminds me a little bit of when i used to have dal travel when i was a kid and i was like this is too much my mom would make them into small small balls right like six or eight balls and be like okay two more two more two more and then my meal went faster and then I'm done. That's kind of what needs to happen with, with shorter attention spans, but, a, but an openness to seeing more frequency. I think this example of Dal Chawal will be etched in our minds. Uh, <laughs> Everybody's had that happen. So. <laughs> and we'll remember, uh, the marketers will remember it for their strategies. Another thing that I picked up uh, when you spoke about frequency and variety, uh, you know, and sometimes is also adding different chutneys and achar with that dal chawal, uh, you know, to keep on engaging with this audience, if I may add to that, right? So very well put, uh, Virginia. I would love to get Nikhil into this discussion. You know, what are the creative and intelligent ways in which we can use marketing technology uh, to really engage and delight uh, this always on consumer? And not just for the first time, but also re-engagement. How can we continue doing that? Hey, so that's a, that's a big question and uh, let me try and, and break it into two components. I think uh, how to use MarkTech in terms of engaging with customers is, is essentially uh, a combination of how much relevance can you create for your content and service, how much personalization are you able to deliver, how, how real time can you be, uh, you know, uh, how targeted you are, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So that's a, that's a that's a really vast uh, topic, but, but these are some of the key building blocks. When it comes to uh, more specifically re-engaging or remarketing, uh, I think most people know and they see, you know, anytime you, you visit a website and you jump off it, you see that you are being chased uh, by, by ads. You're also being targeted on social media. So, so market can play a very important role. Um, at least most places I work, we always had the GA suite, so that, that helps in exactly defining the URL from where somebody has come and jumped off. I think what's really important is how do you add context to your remarketing and it, and it, it does not become dumb or does not become, uh, you know, somebody who's really literally running after you uh, with something. And how does it stop once you've actually chosen not to respond to it uh, or you actually bought something? You often uh, get chased for products and brands that you have purchased, but uh, hey, the company who is sending the remarketing mailers never know it. So they'll keep keep bombarding you and that that becomes irritating after a while and the entire concept of ad blocking and things like that kick in uh, so i think context is important so are you talking about the same sku the same color the same price point that i came and uh, checked for are you capping the right amount of frequency so that i don't get irritated have you also put in the kind of mediums that you would want uh, to retarget me if I'm actually consuming uh, content uh, on COVID or learning about a vaccine, I don't want to be chased for a t-shirt, for example. That's not good context. So, so how can you build that intelligence by using tools such as uh, you know, programmatic marketing and things like that? So, so remarketing is, is a really big topic. Uh, I think I've always seen that whenever you, you try to add context and be very specific and put a reasonable frequency cap, 
uh, it, it generally works and over a period of time you can actually create remarketing lists you can you can seed it or almost nurture it like a funnel which some people call as you know nurturing a funnel over a period of time so so don't just forget somebody after a week or seven days because your campaign run out but you know what about the next 30 days or what about next time you got something really good so maybe you could not incite entice somebody the first time but this time you feel it's relevant the customer has probably come during this time again through one of your channels can you build in that intelligence can you add that layer uh, to the remarketing message at that time so that so that it becomes more relevant i think these are some of the things that help uh, you know reengaging better than than standard remarketing techniques i would say oh. nikhil definitely context stands out you know and i think that's a important takeaway for everyone uh, you know as they say that content is king but context is the king maker and uh, without the king maker your content may not be useful some call it queen but i won't say it on this panel <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> great lovely i would also love some sonia's thoughts on this right uh, what are the creative ways in which uh, martech can be leveraged uh, to delight uh, these audiences no so you you're absolutely right you know what you said about the context and the content uh, I, i think you have to be innovative and today we do have so much access to technology like we i'll give you a couple of examples of things we've done uh, so we used uh, one of uh, an innovative uh, technique on one of these uh, discovery platforms uh, right where we actually uh, you know we like to actually push the customer without action without saying so to interact with us on voice uh, by saying our brand name and it really really well okay uh, and the person never felt that it was intrusive right and this is only possible because of uh, martech today right uh, we also did one very interesting uh, rich media ad where we allowed the consumer to come on to our banner and engage with our newly launched chatbot through the banner right so these are small ways of you know engaging them and reengaging them and these are people anyway coming right and they're following you they're actually coming on your website so you know uh, taking from what nikhil said it's obvious if i today just start uh, following my customer and remarketing blindly without context and uh, you know the person has moved and, and you know my category is a little sensitive uh, i i don't know why they were searching for me are they scared is there some fear psychosis that, that has led to it or they genuinely looking as proactive financial planners and that that is rare so it may be more in the covid times where people are just waking up to the idea not necessarily fear very very scared but um, they're waking up to the idea but uh, as a as a category i need to remind uh, a little more subtly in a in a little more uh, uh, easy going and comfortable manner which does not threaten people so uh, i also need to invite uh, engagement rather than thrust it so uh, i think marketing technology has played a very big role for us to be able to do that that's 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 uh, very valuable sonia uh, i just want to broaden our discussion slightly uh, and uh, focus on this one important uh, thing which is listening and today listening has become a very valuable tool in the arsenal of all cmos right uh, and listening not just to respond to your customer but listening actually to understand them and with that understanding possibly creating moments of delight possibly adding something in your business offering or maybe doing a marketing campaign right and that's how today is being leveraged i would love to uh, you know get roshni into the discussion uh, and uh, ask her what are the ways in which listening uh, has helped uh, your brand to do campaigns or to do things differently um uh, yes i i think uh, you're right i think listening has become uh, a very important tool across uh, most brands and marketers and yeah we, we do use our own set so tools i'm sure a lot of you are also using tools like talkwalker to make sure that you're listening uh, on an ongoing fashion but yeah I, i would step back and say say that eventually uh, you know listening tools or technology they, they they're just tools they're not a strategy right so i think once you look at what your consumer is saying then you tailor make a solution as as uh, sonia was talking about so what we've done is through our ongoing engagement with our say the game audience because you brought it up um, a while ago and then we also talked about uh, superheroes right um we've been looking at doing something more interesting given the fact that they're all at home again one is that we have a fairly strong fan following because we've got like a slew of amazing gaming um, based pieces and uh, secondly during this time as i said you know gaming um, gaming hours went up significantly 
but we had to engage them again we you know we're conscious of the fact that screen time becomes a problem not many parents want people to have random uh, you know pubg playing so what we did was we uh, created this whole a piece called gamer in the house and we used uh, different kind of stacks pretty uh, nicely so we used the google stack of course we picked four influencers we brought them to the same platform uh, they all streamed live on their youtube uh, channels brought in their own uh, followers and because it was gamer in the house uh, it was a 6 hour marathon so people could come in uh, engage with the influencers and step out and during the 6 hours seriously it started at 5:30 people were on 8:30 we had some 350000 collective views over the 6 hours and um, you know budding gamers came and asked for tips and tricks how can i be a good gamer what are some of the things that you do to be a good gamer so what we were able to do is uh, kept it interactive and then what's interesting also is that you were allowed to engage through your instagram profile so you know we we made sure that they already have profiles they already have um, you know a place where they want to kind of show uh, what, what they engaged with with their favorite uh, influencer so each time they'd answer something in a quirky manner we would send out to so i felt like we used different platforms quite interestingly you know streaming platforms of course we had to get uh, you know the uh, the back end infrastructure right plus uh, a more uh, front facing platform like instagram and we were able to marry a being at home concept pretty nicely so i think we did that more uh, for the end consumers but i think uh, to pick up from where um, nikhil was talking about right you're right i think personalized marketing uh, has to be valuable if you if you're chasing the customer or at least providing the customer messaging that they want so he's right we have a huge number of stacks whether it's you know google advertising cloud to oracle db on lacqua to uh, salesforce the many tools where you can get a spectrum but i think for intel what we do is we have a custom suite which picks all these data patterns and then you have a live dashboard a self serve dashboard to see whether you're targeting say uh, enterprise that actually wants to look at ai because you know health monitoring is becoming very important and therefore contactless uh, solutions are more important and is that what they want to uh, would, would find valuable at this point in time or is somebody looking at a cloud deployment because you know you want you want your information to be safe during uh, the times of covid and you want business continuity so we've got self serve dashboards that pull all of these tech tools together so we're remarketing and sequencing content for our b2b audiences also so it's been interesting the last 3 months where we've been able to talk to a spectrum of audiences and make use of tech tools hey social that's very interesting how different platforms are being married together to come up with a cohesive solution um, and, and that's actually also the beauty of martech right sometimes you look at them in silos but the two two beauty comes in when you integrate different platforms and they talk to each other uh, to really drive value uh, it very valuable on that front i would love to get virginia into this discussion uh, because you know listening and insights are important but then listening insights also give us uh, to focus on certain key areas of a business right uh, you know and uh, we've been hearing a lot about how there's a increase of podcast since the covid mm. has come in um, and uh, you know how possibly this may be the year of actually podcast becoming mainstream uh, right and i would love some of virginia Is that real? Is that for real? Do we think that podcast is going to become the next big thing in India? You know, the funny thing is, podcasts are pretty mainstream for you know our tier one types, as well as you know in in other markets. We've seen an eighteen percent increase in overall podcast streams, but I think a couple of interesting observations about the Indian consumer, right? If you look at the categories in which we've seen the largest increase. Um, there is a 245% increase in news podcasts now you must be wondering like you've seen a lot of like people saying okay you know obviously with corona going on uh, everybody's watching you know the news but maybe they're not watching the news they're listening to the news and i think a lot of what we found is people want the news they want to know what's going on because they want to feel informed that actually gives them comfort but there's something that is quite jarring about the visuals on tv And so what we've seen is initially when when you know covid first came out and a bunch of other things have been going on in the world that are a little crazy uh you saw you know increase in tv consumption but there's a little bit of fatigue not just of screen time but of visual stimulation you know people don't want like you mentioned you know children elderly you know they're 
you know, that the issues of mental health, watching these very jarring images of people dying and, and other things, that people want the information. So where are they going to get the information, right? They're going to get it on, on their screens. And so a quick, you know, if I look at our daily coronavirus update, you know, all about corona, that's, that's basically seen a lot of growth because it's very bite-sized and it's just what you need to know about coronavirus for five minutes. There's no, there's no back and forth yelling, screaming. There's no visuals of people dying. It's just in Hindi, the news or in whatever. So that's the one observation is people are consuming news as podcasts. The second is we're actually seeing uh, a lot of history and, um, you know, uh, history and, and other categories like history, society, uh, children, as I mentioned earlier, and, uh, you know, film and TV. So what people are trying to figure out is how do I create, um, you know, opportunities to learn and engage potentially my family members, my kids, without necessarily them being stuck on a screen. So, you know, how do I actually get tell them stories, etc. cetera? Um, I think Roshni gave a great example of parents needing to learn how to become educators. One of the most popular podcasts on right now is called Raising Parents, which is parents actually talking about how they're handling raising children, which, by the way, if you speak to a lot of them, said not much has changed in lockdown. We've always had these challenges, you know, entertaining our kids. But, you know, I think that people are turning to advice from others that, that look and sound like them. The podcast that we're seeing less of is obviously like movie reviews because there aren't that many movies, right? Uh, like the filmy stuff and things like that. So, you know, podcasts are definitely a place to listen. But I just want to also mention that listening is at this point not just about what we can see in the data and what that is. I, I would actually argue uh, we, we call, you know, probably a few hundred customers every week in brand solutions. And we actually had a brand last week, marketer last week or an agency that actually thanked us for calling them because nobody's called them since, since the shutdown because they have no budgets. And so a few weeks ago, when we started seeing this pattern of everybody will call you when you have budgets and you're doing IPL and you're doing this and that, suddenly nobody's calling you when you have no advertising out. And, you know, here we are, uh, we're the advertising team and we're calling people to check in on them because, you know, we're just, we're just calling. And so we came up with something called the starter pack for June where we're actually giving away a thousand dollars of free advertising to any advertiser and because we heard the we heard the audiences talk about you know they don't have money right now but that they need to let people know that they're back online you know there's some small uh, restaurants and stuff that people don't know that they're not closed anymore so we said okay you know what what seven days thousand dollars you know thirty five thousand spots do it right and um, that's just a decision we made from listening to our to our customers by calling them because people stop calling them. So I would say sometimes being a little old fashioned in terms of listening means not only just getting all excited about trends and dashboards and social listening, but maybe just calling people. Uh, it actually works. So. Nice. nice. I really picked it up. And I think two things is one is a thousand dollars ad credit that a lot of marketers will be listening to right now. And the second one is podcasts, right? Because if that's not a part of your, content strategy for your brand in today's times, possibly you have to relook it a bit if it fits in. Great. I would love also some insights from Nikhil on the, this front in terms of listening and how brands can leverage it for their benefit. Is, is Dyson doing something around it? So, hey, I think everybody mentioned that listening is absolutely critical and listening is not only social media listening. Of course, we use sprinkler here. Uh, but uh, even otherwise, listening is like Virginia mentioned, calling your customers and listening to them. Listening is calling your front line teams. Listening is going through chat scripts. Listening is listening to the inbound calls, reading up a few WhatsApp messages and uh, really getting a good uh, gut feel about the sense of the situation. So one is what all the data and heuristics are going to throw at you. And the other is what's your overall feeling? What do you sense? And uh, a lot of what we do in our job is, is a blend of science and art, right? So, so gut is really important. I'll give you one example that that's we are recently trying. So, very relevant for this panel. Uh, so, something that so we are also into hair styling products. So, we have Supersonic and Dyson Hair App, uh, quite iconic worldwide. And uh, one of the things is that as women are going lesser and lesser to work and out of home, 
typically, uh, you know, we thought that the sales for some of these products are, is not going to be as, as good as, as for example, vacuum cleaners. But when we actually listen to this data, uh, the listening data, which is not only social listening, but for everything together, you know, there is something called a Zoom look, which is really important. There is a Zoom party look and there is a webinar look and there are, there are some 17 types of looks that the team actually put together which is, uh, you know, people still want to look good. And, you know, what the biggest look was, was just looking good for oneself. And therefore, we really repositioned the entire campaign around that, you know, hey, it's your hairstylist at home. We know you don't want to go to salons anymore. We know that you are scared to step out. But, uh, hey, we can bring that, uh, you know, right at your fingertips. And to back that, what we did was we put an entire stylist army in the form of a video demo really teaching people how to do and style their own hair. And, and you know, for example, Aduna is doing uh, one Instagram live for Dyson today at 5 p.m. Uh, Vogue is doing one this coming Tuesday. And we then got together with some of these brands, some of these large beauty media companies who, who do this for a living and really position our product there for, for women who want to style at home. So this is just one example which would not intuitively come to you. But if you actually listen to comments and you and you listen to your customers, uh, you know the need for styling is still good. Uh, the context has changed. So yeah, that's, that's one example which is quite recent. Nick, a very relevant example and very very creatively done to add value to uh, your consumers. Uh, you know, I would also love some thoughts from Sonia, uh, just from this perspective of listening and our brand is India first doing something differently. Uh, you know, we heard about this entire activation with Amazon. Uh, that India First is done. Would you love to share a bit more about that? Yes. Uh, uh, I'm so glad you've heard of it. Uh, so what we did is it was a very contextual thing. And again, insurance can't be thrust upon you. Uh, you will find it uh, intrusive. So we actually connected. Uh, we did with, the, with Amazon. We did a first of its kind. Where anyone searches for cover, our ad would pop up. And it would not be a jarring ad. It would be a softer. It would not have a uh, call to action. It would more be about the category and the brand. So this was a very interesting, uh, uh, you know, initiative we did around uh, December, Jan. We actually got uh, phenomenal uh, results. We also did a very interesting campaign with the uh, Geo Salon, uh, where we actually gave, uh, we made a small little uh, cover kawali, as we called it. We got Aftar Raja in, and we did a small uh, song on getting covered, uh, right? And uh, it, it was called Dhaklia. And it did supremely well on GeoSava. We were shocked at the results because we already we had some engagement parameters we had agreed on, and we went up off the sky and uh, uh, you know uh, on those parameters because uh, it kind of you know hit home. So we actually listened to our audiences and we realized what uh, at least the, low, the 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 millennials are actually connecting with. But we also did one very interesting campaign that came out of listening both uh, socially and outside. Right? Uh, we we spoke about listening beyond. Uh, the, the net or the web or, or digital mediums, right? Uh, one of the things we realized is people don't trust insurance. They don't think they will get their claims. So we did a very interesting uh, segment where we said 100% genuine claims settled. Gar and we called it a guarantee. So we had a guaranteed sign and we did this whole thing where we did 30 second videos of uh, somebody who's trying to con. So, you know, somebody who's trying to hide a cigarette or somebody who's trying to impersonate someone else. And they were funny 30 second video videos. And we said, Look, if we catch you doing this, you're not going to get your claim. So if you actually don't lie, you will have 100% um, claim settlement guarantee. So we did. And that came out of listening. That was a pure outcome out of uh, listening. So these are two or three very interesting things that have come out for us uh, because we listened. And uh, they've been very interesting in terms of uh, interacting with our audience online. Nice. Nice. Very interesting, Sonia. You know, today, no webinar can get complete without using the three golden alphabets, ROI, right? And what are brands doing around it? I would love some perspective from Roshni uh, as to what Intel is doing to really capture ROI. Uh, is it through tools? Is it through creative use of content? How is Intel going about it? Look, I think, um, you know, we've talked to a lot of different examples, right? Finally, I think if you're relevant at the point of what the consumer wants, and if your product serves that need, eventually it becomes a two-way street and you can look at um, ROI. But, you know, I think ROI, to be fair, has taken a different meaning at this point in time. I don't think brands and companies can look at ROI in the traditional uh, form anymore, you know, because today return on, return on investment is not coming as an immediate um, 
you know outcome it is going to be a, a with series of steps that a brand is going to take so while we were thinking about it uh, you know um, we did this new mantra literally called uh, abcde of marketing today to derive uh, roi so um, one is awareness like i said right i mean how do you want to rethink your awareness do you want to give more than get you want to be top of mind but the joy has to be in giving so eventually there's going to be roi because you were there during the time the consumer wanted or needed you i think budgets have become like a very central focus on uh, brands but if um, not having contextual messaging is not relevant at that point in time maybe you want to look at budgets to uh, relook at your databases you know uh, clean up uh, go out and talk to the customers a little more like uh, virginia said so the way you look at your budgets uh, for roi has become different i find like the c of marketing is the compassion part of it right and a lot of people talked about it i, I think at this point uh, the right attribution will happen if there is empathy but if there you know is it is with a certain amount of action and then yeah uh, a lot of uh, data has to be seen differently now right is is the data being used to sequence the right messaging anymore is it contextual um so i feel like we've had to look at the roi very differently across you know the marketing stack and you're right i think a lot of it has come together to see how we're you know uh, preparing to listen to our customers to our consumers to our ecosystem because intel is about talking to a varied number of audiences right from end users to oems to csps to isps to uh, you know and different audiences as well so having taken time to be in touch with them and relooking at the marketing stack has evolved to look at roi slightly more long term i would say and then point in time actions that we talked about uh, through the conversation so maybe not a straight answer but i i, I do think roi has to be defined slightly more differently and less commercially during this time fair enough roshi any other advice that you would have for brands and marketers to win in this new world or what is your one line mantra which you which you always follow while doing any marketing or any activity i would say two line mantra one is actionable insights listening is only valuable if you can do something about it and uh, second especially during this time acts not ads people uh, see you do things you have to walk the talk so empathy with action is uh, a mantra that we definitely follow it in great actionable insights and acts not ads you know would love uh, so that's that's wonderful would love uh, nikhil's thoughts on this right nikhil roi as well as what is your advice to brands and marketers and what is your magic mantra okay lots of questions in that uh, on the point of roi i think uh, it's both long term and short term for for us it's 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 gone completely in a different direction so there is a way more pressure in terms of generating immediate returns i think cash is is the king now and and that's undisputed so companies are in survival mode and people are really going short term in terms of really asking hard questions about the investments that they are putting especially on the on in the area of marketing this is you know this is a disposable line for for many organizations therefore all the more responsibilities for cmo to really defend their lines i think overheads and marketing budgets are two most discussed items today in every any corporate boardroom uh, so therefore how do you actually establish the attribution of a certain marketing action and link it back to sales was never more in my opinion than it is now i would also like to comment that you know in terms of awareness now whom do you really reach out to you would potentially reach out to somebody who is engaged with you in one way or the other before because you know that's that's potentially going to give you higher return in the immediate sense and uh, you know what kind of offers do you do how do you personalize stuff all of that focused through this phase for survival and then you know really gaining back growth and then potentially thriving so my view on roi is, is slightly different though i completely agree with roshi that in terms of an overall organization's point of view i mean return on marketing expense stroke investment is also is always uh, you know something that should come with a the long term view uh, in terms of my mantra it's very simple i think brands at this point in time uh, there's only one word for me that's that's being authentic so the brands should be transparent the brands uh, need to own up and the brand needs to generate trust i think if brands do that uh, this is this is what really customers are looking for correct no yeah. nikhil very well put i think in this virtual world what people are craving the most is authenticity and if a brand can be authentic i think the relationship will be very deep so thank you for that i would love some parting thoughts from sonia uh, on this aspect of uh, what is her advice to marketers and uh, one line mantra for her so my one line mantra is uh, get the cust- uh, 
try and be a part of the customer's journey rather than asking the customer to be a part of yours. And if you manage to do that, you anyway won the customer. Great. I think I think there's very well put, very short, very actionable, and keeping customer at the center of it. Yeah. What are some thoughts from Virginia on uh, you know what is your mantra and what is your advice to brands and marketers which are joining us today at this webinar? Yeah, actually, my, my mantra has been the same for about 10 years, which is marketing needs to be a service, not an interruption. Uh, and so exactly what the others have said, which is compassion, action, you know, uh, in terms of being part of their journey. And right now, what we want to do is, you know, the service that we want to provide is comfort and also lower people's risk, because that's what we're seeing is that I think you have to figure out for your brand, what is that service? that you can deliver at this particular point because people will not forget what you do, good or bad or nothing at this time. Uh, everybody, whether it be your future employer or a future customer will say, where were you in these times and what did you do? And I think this is a very career defining and also sort of life cycle defining thing for brands on, on what they do right now. Very nicely put Virginia, very important moment for us, for professionals, for brands. Uh, and today, I think collectively, we learned a lot of things. Uh, obviously, we learned the Dal Chawal example. Uh, <laughs> but we also learned the power of authenticity, uh, the power of frequency and variety, right? And how to keep customer at the center of everything that we're doing. We also learned about acts, not ads, and driving actionable insights. Um, and I think all of us are richer with uh, the experiences uh, that all of you have shared. Uh, so thank you so much uh, for this. We have a lot of questions coming in. Uh, and uh, uh, due to paucity of time, uh, you know, we'll be addressing these questions on social media. Uh, so please, uh, you know, on the Exchange for Media LinkedIn post, uh, all of you, if you can put in your questions, and then the expert panel will uh, do its best to answer it back over there uh, for all of you. So thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Exchange for Media, for uh, inviting all of us to enrich its audience. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, Emma, for being a lovely panel, panel moderator. Thank you. 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 Thank you.